this feast of the Holy Cross can sometimes be a little strange when we really look at what is going on. It's the exaltation of the Holy Cross, the raising of the Holy Cross, cross in adoration. But what do we adore? What does the cross represent? Our crucifix, the crucifixes that we have in our homes that we wear around our own necks, are first of all an instrument of torture and death. It's the death penalty of Roman times. On it is the body of Christ. Not Christ alive or Christ coming down from the cross, but Christ nailed to the cross and dead on the cross. Why would we choose to use that as our symbol? Why do we choose to adorn our homes and our, even ourselves with the cross and Christ on it? For many, it might be even scandalous. And in some of the Protestant churches, for example, they won't use the crucifix. They'll put a cross, but it's empty. Or they might have what they call the resurrectrix, the resurrectrix, the cross, but with Christ resurrected and coming down from the cross. Because they say, well, Christ rose from the dead. We, we shouldn't picture him dead. We shouldn't keep him on the cross. He came off of it. Or he came from, uh, from the dead. And so they don't like to use the crucifix. And in fact, they'll criticize the use of the crucifix. Yet we as Catholics persist on that crucifix. It is our sign, it is our symbol by excellence. We are born with it above us in baptism. We're buried with the cross, the crucifix on the last day. The crucifix is the sign by excellence of Christians, and especially of Catholics. But why use that which seems the symbol of death, the symbol of perhaps what we most fear as our sign? Well, there's something to be said, and we see in that first reading about raising that which we fear the most and facing and confronting it. In fact, embracing it. We hear the story of how the Israelites were bitten by the serpents. They were tortured by the serpents, and it became a symbol or a way of death for them in that desert as they wandered for 40 years. Yet when they turned to the Lord and finally asked for some respite, what does the Lord say? Make a golden version of that serpent, of what stings you of what you hate, of what is bringing you suffering and death. Make a beautiful version of it. Raise it and gaze upon it. And who gazes upon it will overcome the sting of that serpent and the death. Strange almost. But isn't that what we do also with the cross? We make a beautiful cross. We have golden crosses adorned with diamonds and jewels perhaps the most exquisite pieces of art that our faith has produced, is that cross. And so just as the serpent, which normally has a negative connotation, serpent doesn't represent usually what is good, the Israelites make a golden, a beautiful version of it to be raised up and to be looked at. And so the cross, which in any other time would represent something ugly, the death penalty, death itself, injustice, we make a beautiful version of it and adorn ourselves with it and we gaze upon it. In some of the greater churches and cathedrals, the crucifix is rightly the centerpiece of what our older attention is looking at. What the Israelites do and what that serpent represents is that greatest fear, perhaps. The greatest fear that any man can have. And we can think of all our fears collected, perhaps none ever equals the fear of death itself. And rightly so, whatever can kill us, we fear the most. We respect the most, so much that we can keep a, a good safe distance from it. Those other things that we fear, and we can think of so many other things, think of what our, rela our reaction normally is. I can think of the students, for example, in school that, well, maybe they're not so good at math, and the math test comes in, and that is what they fear, because that could be, well, that could cost them their summer. That could cost them a grade. They can get in trouble. And so out of that fear, you kind of look the other way and 
try not to try to forget about it and focus on something else and you don't end up studying for the test and then your greatest fear does do you in that F they can get in that test will sink them it will sink or ruin their vacation if their parents get angry so with us through our life and maybe even professional life when we see something that we fear that can cost us even our career we might want to look the other way try not to engage it run away from it see if it can take care of itself but oftentimes you see if those things are unchecked they will do us in they will end our careers and so what the Lord tells Israelites to do is to face that fear in a very special way and we've heard it before face your fears they face their fears because by facing that fear, they overcome it. And even something as great as death, which the serpent represents and the bite of the serpent represents, can be overcome. And it's the same thing that we're invited to do when we gaze at the cross. That greatest fear, that greatest fear of a death, of a painful death even, of an undignified death on the cross that Jesus went through, we're called to look at it, to face it, even to embrace it, as Jesus did. Because when we do, and as Jesus did embrace that cross, literally hugging it and clinging to it, he also overcame the penalty that came with it, the death. No, Christ does not stay dead. He rises again, but he only rises because he confronted that cross. Not only did he confront the cross, he overtook it and he owned it. He made it his. And by doing so, not only does he govern, not only does he become the governor of life, but also of the resurrection. Perhaps that's a Christian challenge and what this feast represents for us to look at that cross, but also look at what it represents in our lives and to confront that which we fear, perhaps that fear that we might have even of our own mortality, but to embrace us to the point that we own it and so that we can overcome it with Christ as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.